What's up, Coachable family? You're in for a treat today because if you are part of the coaching or entrepreneurial world and you've been hanging out and listening to podcasts long enough, you've probably heard the name Julie Solomon. And that's my guest today. Julie is a business coach, speaker, and host of the top rated influencer podcast. She's also the author of the upcoming book, Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. She's been an inspiration for me over the past few years. And I look to her as a um, a guide for me when I started this podcast only a few few years back when I was getting started as a coach and building my own personal brand. Her entrepreneurial courses such as Pitch It Perfect, The Influencer Academy, and Shine teach clients how to master the important skill sets needed to take their personal brand idea and turn it into a profitable, sustainable business. Her upcoming book, Get What You Want, is for people who are tired of being told, just be yourself, and teaches you how to shake off outdated ideas of what is possible and use your newfound belief to make anything you want happen. Most importantly, it gives you the confidence to love and accept yourself so you can become unstoppable. Now, before we jump into this interview with Julie, which I cannot wait to get to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of my favorite brands and happens to be sponsors of this show, Organifi, because if you can hear the little tingle in my throat, I am not 100% today. I am not firing on all cylinders. My body is a little weak because I'm coming off of a really harsh like three-day cold, which has really been like an upper respiratory infection. But what I'm remembering and what I'm being drawn back to is that my body is a healer and it's also an amazing organic machine because what it does is it turns food into energy and it heals our wounds. It supports our consciousness and so, so much more, but it needs the right fuel and signals to function at its best. And lately I have not been functioning at my best and I'll tell you one reason why I haven't been getting in my daily dose of Organifi. Because here's the thing, some of the signals include adaptogens, the signals that my body needs to know how to heal itself, to to fire on all cylinders, include adaptogens. And those are the compounds that balance our hormones. They help you deal with stress in a healthier way. And if you're feeling tired like I have been, these are the compounds that give you a boost of energy, which you know I need. So if you're stressed, if you're coming off a cold, if you have been feeling lethargic or fatigue and you want to return to that natural state of calm and high energy, then you literally need to help your body adapt to the stress of life. And my favorite source of these adaptogens is Organifi. They are so easy to get what I need, even though I have been slacking. They create these delicious superfood blends that all I have to do is put it in my water, blend it like blend it up with a spoon and drink it. They make it as easy as that. And, um, That's how I get my daily adaptogens in, including things like ashwagandha, reishi mushroom, and so much more. And uh, if you're looking for an easy way to support your immune health and your body, I highly recommend checking out Organifi. You can go to Organifi.com slash Tori Gordon and use the code Tori20 at checkout and you will get 20% off all of your products. So go over Organifi.com slash Tori Gordon and use Tori20 at checkout. Now, let's jump into this interview with Julie Solomon. What's up, Coachable family? Welcome back to another episode of the Coachable Podcast. I hope you are ready to learn today how to grow in your confidence and in your ability to show up authentically and share your voice because we have an amazing ambassador for this. Julie Solomon is here with us. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tori, for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to pour into your incredible community today and to help them get what they want. Um, This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. We all want more of that, more of what we want, less of what you know, (laughs) creates, yeah, less of what we don't want, less of what creates suffering and pain and just limitation. I am, um, I'm wanting more health at the moment. If you can hear my little, you know, scratchy voice. Um, and there's, you know, some steps to getting what we want, but I just want to first just acknowledge you for your work and, and how you've been 
um, a light in my life. I see this like big sign behind you that says shine. And you've been doing that for, for years now. And I remember when I was first getting into this industry, first starting my show and getting into coaching, I was looking to people like you as guidance for what's possible and where I could be and what I wanted my future to look like. And I would, I would kind of self-assess and be like, here's where I am today, but where do I want to be in six months? Where do I want to be a year from now? And often it was people like you that sort of, um, illuminated what that could possibly look like a, a future that I had not yet stepped into, but I knew by looking at you, what I could achieve. And so I just want to acknowledge you for being a bright light for not just me, but people. Um, I know other people in this that are listening to the show know who you are and have been following your story, but I'd love for those who are new to you and haven't heard of you before uh, to give us a little background on who you are and what you do and uh, your sort of your origin story and, and how you ended up here today. Yeah, and I just thank you so much for reflecting that back to me. And um, it's funny that I remember when I started out, um, you know, 2013, 2014, kind of doing what I what ne- what is now what I do today, I would, you know, look to look to people just like what you were saying, those that I found really inspiring and those that really showed me that it was possible to get what I want, even if I thought that getting what I want was impossible. And those always kind of, you know, were my guiding lights. And so I, you know, I feel like it's so important to not only see that in others, but to allow ourselves to see that in others so we can step into that and become that ourselves. And that is why I, I never assume, I think the responsibility for someone else's happiness or success, because I am not that powerful, nor would I ever Mm -hmm. think that I am that powerful. I just try to express in my own way that if you turn into what it is that you want to become. And if you really start turning into the possibility of that, the beingness of that, um, you can tar- start to experience not only the benefit of what it is that you want, but really the benefit of your own success and happiness. It's kind of when we become dependent on what others are doing and how others are feeling, and most of all, how others think and feel about us, that's when it puts mm-hmm. us in a very powerless and hopeless position because now we're dependent upon what somebody else is doing with their focus mm-hmm. over something that we don't have control over. And so mm-hmm. um, I'm a big advocate of exactly everything that you just said, which I think kind of goes into, yeah, who I am and, and my origin story. Um, my name is Julie Solomon. Um, I, from a business side of things, I have, um, I have a background in PR and marketing. I was a book publicist and music publicist for about seven years before I got into this beautiful online world that is uh, coaching. Um, I started out um, living in New York City with no friends, no job, no place to live. I had never, I'd only been there once before, fell in love with the city, moved there immediately after college and, and dove in and started learning a lot of things very, very quickly about the landscape that was PR and that. um, And then, of course, lots of things happened between then and when I started my business today. But that really kind of laid the foundation of what it is that I do today. Um, Early on in my career as a publicist, when I started to um, kind of dream a little bit bigger and think about, you know, what if, you know, wouldn't it be great if Mm -hmm. I could have my own business? Wouldn't it be great if I could work from home? Wouldn't it be great if, you know, I could you know, work for people that actually appreciate me and my accomplishments without having to bend to whatever it is that they want. Wouldn't it be great to make as much money as I can imagine making all of those things. And so um, I had moved to moved to New York, moved back to Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm from, then moved to Los Angeles. And at the time in LA, Tori, this idea of blogging and content creation and what we now know to be influencer marketing was really becoming a thing. And Los Angeles has been and really was at the time really the mecca for content creators. It was the top 1% of the top 1% of those influencers um, and not just on the lifestyle side, but even coaches. I mean, the top people Mm -hmm. who were creating courses and programs at the time, the top people who were on podcasts, the top people who were doing all of that. Um, predominantly men at the time, except for the lifestyle content creators or the fitness content creators that were women. And um, as a way to kind of, 
you know, connect and make friends because it was in some ways I found myself like I did in New York with like no friends. <laughs> you know, I had like mm -hmm. my PR thing going on, but I had left my cushiony corporate job and I was trying to do this thing on my own. And as a way to connect yeah. to that community and meet people, I started blogging. And I quickly learned through my process of blogging that the women around me did not need my you know, fashion tips or my mom mm -hmm. tips, they needed my marketing and branding support. And so I was able to kind of quickly monetize my online and personal brand because I did have the background in PR and marketing. Um, and so right. women would come to me and they would say, you know, no offense, Julie, but how is it that you have like a few thousand followers and you're consistently making money every single month and building this brand? I have hundreds of thousands of followers, which at the time would have been like millions today. And mm -hmm. I like may sell shirts off of my back from like an affiliate company, <laughs> you know, like how is it right. that you're able to really set yourself apart? And it's because I really understood marketing and PR. And so from that, I kind of got this idea of, well, what if I started to support these women in a deeper way? What if I start to consult them on how to monetize and how to pitch themselves and how to negotiate for what they were worth and how to believe in what they were worth? And so I started doing that for a while. And then, of course, I hit my limit of the clients that I could take on and started to look around at the online landscape and started to see that these online courses and these online programs were kind of becoming a thing. So I said, well, why don't I take this method that clearly works, my pitch method that I had, you know, cultivated throughout my years of being a publicist and um, put it, create an online course around it. And so in 2016, I did just that. I created a course called Pitch It Perfect that has now seen over 7,000 people go through it. It's made multi-million dollars in revenue. It completely changed my life. I had no idea at the time. I had no idea what I was doing, first off. Mm -hmm. No idea what I was doing. But I had no idea that a course that I literally created in three months could have the impact that it had. And I, and I think what was important to that, I'm no one special. It wasn't that I had some secret sauce that no one else understood. I just, I had a solution that provided a really specific problem for somebody. And I really mm -hmm. focused on the documentation and the effectiveness of that method that was putting yourself out there, pitching yourself, negotiating for yourself. And that's what people were buying into was the process and the result. And luckily, you know, there's kind of that saying of you sell them what they want, but you give them what they need. And so I was selling mm -hmm. people on what they wanted, which was I want money. I want a big personal brand. I want to be able to, you know, have this online platform that impacts people. And I want to be able to travel and, you know, have money to, to spend and to use it however I want. But what I was really able to, to give them what they needed, and this is the biggest feedback that, that, that comes from any of the work that I do, whether it's through my courses or through my coaching, is that you know, my clients will say, or my students, that you gave me the confidence to actually believe that I could do something that I never thought was possible. And it is that work. You gave me the clarity to get really clear on what I wanted, and then you gave me the confidence to go for it. And so I think that that has been you know, the, the biggest um, gift to me, I think, just kind of thinking back on it to think that this little course that could would not only go off to help people make millions of dollars in revenue, which in and of itself is wildly incredible because of the impact that you can have with that kind of money, but also the confidence to believe in themselves in a way that they never knew was possible. And, um, confidence has always been something really important to me because I didn't have it for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Well, yeah, I think there's so much that I love about what you just shared. And I, I would imagine somebody watching you right now thinking, how how can this woman have ever struggled with confidence? She's the whole package. She, you know, she has a book and she has a multi seven figure business and she you know, is she's so put together, she must have always been this way. And I think that's the illusion that we fall into sometimes. Like also this, this idea that people came to you because they were struggling with a problem around how do I, how do I become relevant? How do I get seen? How do I get um, eyes on my business or on my brand? 
And that can feel elusive to those that don't have the background that you did, right? For, for those of us that didn't have a PR marketing background and have, have chosen to take our skill sets and our talents and turn it into something, it can feel like this dark black hole of how do I actually get my name out there and how do I um, create a buzz around what I do because I believe in it and I, I know the power of what I can offer and that it can change the world and can change people's lives. But this this PR thing, this marketing thing has got me stumped. And I think there's so much in one, recognizing that that whoever's listening to this, if you have a skill set, like if you there's something that you do and that you do well, you can monetize it and you can turn it into a personal brand and you can so help other people solve for that problem because just because you know something doesn't mean everyone else understands that. And I think a lot of times we just assume that everyone knows the same information that we know. Well, and I think that that also allows us to really advocate for our excuses. Um, because I know that when I share my story, especially with my background, it, it's going to make um, immediately in our brains that we, we do this as a way to, to stay safe, that someone's going to say, well, easy for her to say she had a PR background. Easy for her to mm -hmm. say, you know, she, whatever, whatever they want to make up and tell themselves. But what I always say to that, to people that, you know, start thinking that, and, and I get it too. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at someone and I'll say, well, easy for them to build that kind of business. They're not a mom. You know, they don't have right. kids at home. They've got all this time mm -hmm. in the world just to work on their business, which also isn't true. So the biggest question that right. I love to reflect on is that if you catch yourself going to that, like, well, easy for her to say mode, I want you to ask yourself, what is the payoff of you thinking that? What is the payoff that you get? Does it allow you to stay small? Does it allow you to not take responsibility for what it is that you want? Does it allow you to keep the problems being out there? You know, because we all have a payoff. And so what, what, is, what is some kind of limiting belief that you're holding on to that is getting a payoff from going to that just quick excuse, reactive thought? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really important to touch on is that, you know, someone can can see someone and it's like, yes, they're so put together they're, They have all the ducks in a row. Everything looks so great. But I've come to find Tori and I don't know if you have too. the ones that seem the most post put together are usually the ones that are so afraid of falling apart. Mm -hmm. And that is why they are so put together. And And I am someone who. I know that because I was that for a very long time. Um, I talk a lot in my book, Get What You Want, about origin stories. We all have, they're kind of known like in the Marvel and DC comic book worlds, but we all have an origin story that is unique to us that, you know, our origin story is the story that made us who we are. They're the beliefs, the thoughts, the feelings, the upbringing, you know, the family dynamics that we were in the churches that we might have been in, the religion that we grew up in, and all of these things shape the stories that we choose to believe throughout our life. And so my origin story was one of extreme scarcity. My family did not have a lot of money growing up. My dad lived in extreme poverty. My grandparents had second grade you know, level educations. My grandfather was completely illiterate. He was also a staunch alcoholic. Mm -hmm. He beat my grandmother. Um, a lot. And so there was there was a lot of abuse, a lot of addiction, a lot of poverty um, that I was around and I was accustomed to at a very young age. My parents did not go to college. My dad literally wore a blue collar to work every day, you know, just a very small town working class family, which also lended to a very small town working class mindset. So I mm -hmm. believed as a young girl that there was never enough money to go around. Um, money was hard. You had to suffer in order to achieve things. You had to suffer to succeed. Um, life wasn't easy. All of these kinds of beliefs that I had. And then I also learned at a young age that the more that I made everybody else feel really good, the more praise and love that I got. So there was this, mm -hmm. you know, massive scarcity mindset that also came in with this 
worthiness that I, the only way that I could be worthy is if someone else validated me. And I lived for a very long time, desperately needing other people to like me. And if they just liked me, then I could love myself. I could like myself, all would be okay in the world. And you know, I have so many stories, I share them in a book. There's a story about when I was little, I threw one of my favorite baby dolls in the trash can because there was a girl in my class that said that dolls were for babies and she didn't want to sit by me. And I told myself mm. at eight years old that this girl didn't like me because of my baby doll. And so if I threw the baby doll away, then she would like me and she would want to sit by me. You know, countless mm -hmm. times, you know, being in relationships and dating these like loser guys that I should have never dated, just, you know, I would automatically like someone back just because they liked me without ever even really right. thinking, do I actually like this person? Do I actually enjoy being around this person? Does this person actually bring you know, good things into my life? Do they actually lift me up? Do they make me a better version of myself? Right. So it was this desperate need to be liked and to be just seen and to be heard. And, you know, and that's what I just want to share with anyone, no matter the excuses that we may put on somebody or no matter how put together or perfect or beautiful someone may be, shame does not discriminate. And no matter if you come from a lot of money or if you come from no money, shame is shame. And they both come, they both can come with heaping amounts of shame. And so can that lack of worthiness and that lack of self love. And the more that we are looking outside of ourselves to find that, the harder of a journey that we're going to have. And one of my favorite quotes in the book that I share is you can't hide yourself and expect to be seen. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, my entire life, that's all I was doing. I was putting on all these different masks. Who, who do you need me to be? I can be anything that you want me to be and more. Just like me, just validate me, right. just invite me to your cool table. Let me be part of the cool club, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I needed to do to get that. And I spent decades of my life hiding who I really was until I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I, it was about three years in to um, me living in Los Angeles and I get a call from my husband and he said, when were you going to tell me about the credit card? And at that moment, my entire world started crumbling because my husband had find, found out that I had been hiding over $30,000 of credit card debt from him. And it was in that moment of this rock bottom moment of my shame about scarcity around money. Why can't I be honest about money? Why can't I be honest about my fear of really being seen and heard for who I am? Why can't I just show up in the world and love myself without it being contingent on something or someone else loving me? I mean, all like my whole world, it was just one of those rock bottom moments that here I was now having to face some really harsh realities about you know, my money mindset, my worthiness mindset, my confidence issues, um, my self-loathing mindset, um, you know, some some really kind of bad or negative, I should say, kind of addictive patterns that I had, you know, that I would overspend as a way to, to fill this void. You know, I had a baby mm -hmm. and it, it would feel good to walk into a Sephora Tory and buy some lip gloss. <laughs> like, you know, it would feel, it would feel good sure. to be able to talk to another person that wasn't a baby. It would feel good to do those mm -hmm. things and not have to ask my husband's quote unquote permission because I was raised in right. a family that, you know, the man is, he's the hierarchy financial breadwinner. You have to get everything approved in order to spend or use money. And it was just this really layered you know, just going back to my origin story of all of these things of what kind of then had me at this dining room table now having to come to terms with so much about money, validation, worthiness, acceptance, confidence, not feeling, not ever feeling enough. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had a lot of food issues growing up. I'm, you know, am a probably addicted to sugar, obsessed with sugar, and I used to just eat my feelings. I was always kind of mm. the pudgier girl in middle school and high school. So there was a lot of um, issues around, you know, the way that I looked and my body and just shaming myself. And, you know, I would drive around Los Angeles to all these donut shops and eat a bunch of donuts, but then spit them, spit them out because I, 
I had tried in the past to like throw up and I could never do that. And so I would just eat the food and spit it out back in the bag, which is like really, I didn't realize that that was crazy, you know? So it's, it was a lot of right. these things that on the outside looking in, no one would have thought that about me or seen that about me. Sure. It was like Julie Solomon, this star publicist, she's got these amazing clients. She's doing this, she's doing that. But then behind the scenes, like I was really dealing with a lot of, of really deep things. And so I had to start to really come to terms with a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hearing your story, I relate in so many ways to just the, this incessant need to feel um, like I belonged and that I was accepted and all of the ways that we contort and bend ourselves into positions that are not uh, you know, comfortable nor true to like be who you need me to be so that you'll love me. Because if I'm not, then that will be taken away or then I'll be wrong or then I'll be alone or all of the stories that come with that. And, it, you know, oftentimes I talk a lot about this on the show is that why, why do we have to get to that rock bottom moment? Like, is that a requirement for us to grow and to heal and to find freedom? But, but I think it's pain is a motivator pain, you know, having that moment where you're confronted with all of the stories and all of the layered, you know, reasons and patterns that had led you to that point is a requirement for doing, you know, healing and growth, because otherwise we just continue to do what we've always done, because that's all we've known. And that's how we've survived and gotten through in the world. And on the outside, like you said, no one would have known, we were still like achieving at a certain level or performing at a certain level. So it looks okay. And so when you had that moment, like, what was the process of getting out of that, uh, of that place of this is who I've been, but maybe this isn't who I want to be anymore. Like I want to be like you, you talk about how do you get what you want? Like, I want to be truly confident. I don't want to just pretend like I'm confident. Like <laughs> right. what was that process like? Yeah. You know, I, I think that for some people like myself, I am, I'm a high achiever. Mm -hmm. Um, it comes from my incessant need to feel love and worthiness. Right. I can be relentless. I am a master manifester. Like I, I'm, I'm a powerful human being. Yeah. And I also know that that can serve me very well. And it can also be incredibly destructive right. because it doesn't mean that I'm powerfully manifesting all positive things in my life. I can also powerfully manifest some really unhealthy things in my life. Mm -hmm. And so that was the moment that I was getting to of, you know, 30 three years old, 32 years old at the time, sitting at the dining room table saying, okay, I have achieved a lot in my life and that's great. And, um, but what is not serving me? You know, this hiding money, um, not feeling confident with money. You know, I can make a lot of money, but then if I'm spending it faster than I can make it, then I'm not really being of service to myself or to the world around me. Um, so really starting to become aware that I think is the first step to any recovery process is, and to me, I really think awareness is just kind of, it's the identification that some problem or dysfunction exists in your life and it needs to change. Mm -hmm. That is awareness. And so instead of me just putting my head in the sand, really giving myself the space to be aware without judging myself, because I can be, I'm, I'm really, really hard on myself. I've always been really hard on myself. And again, mm -hmm. in some ways that serves me because sure. it allows me to go for it and be relentless and just not give up. But I can also be very self-critical and self-judgmental. So allow, giving myself the grace to go easy on myself in this state of awareness, that's the first step. For me, the second step was acceptance. And to me, I think this is the hardest thing. A lot of times we can go, we're like, okay, I'm aware of what needs to happen. Now I just wanna like jump into some action and fix it. But if we're not truly ready to accept, and, and really the acceptance is that very uncomfortable place where we have to come to grips with the idea that this problem is a part of me, mm -hmm. but it is not all of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't define me. It doesn't mean that I'm a horrible person you know, just as no other single characteristic would, would define you. It's sure. just merely one piece to the puzzle 
And since it no longer fits, it needs to be removed. But that is the hardest thing to admit to ourselves, that, that a part of us is the problem. But also admitting that to ourselves means that we give ourselves the power to then change it. Right. Because if a part of me is the problem, then can I be willing and capable and able to change that? And then the, fir- so the third step, and these what? are called... No, I just want to like wanna... make a comment on that. So what I'm hearing you say is you become aware of the issue and you also accept responsibility that you are – like that is stemming from you because I think so often we can look and find excuses and reasons for why things are, oh, well, I grew up this way or I didn't have these opportunities and find someone else to blame and to kind of – push that responsibility off on and you're what I'm hearing you say is it's an acceptance of that responsibility for yourself which also empowers you to realize like if I have gotten myself into this I can also get myself out of it and that's up to me and that can be a very powerful place to come into because you're not waiting on someone else to save you or to fix it or something or exactly but but someone has to be ready to do that because again there's a lot of payoff that we get for blaming someone or something else because then we don't have to take accountability so acceptance really means i am choosing to now create a new story origin story thank you you have gotten me this far (laughs) now i'm going to create a new story and i'm going to write a new script and by writing a new script the script changes and Mm -hmm. i am going to choose to believe that my acceptance begins and ends with me so it doesn't make me a bad person i don't have to go to the judging but it's allowing me to accept what is as it is and if i don't want this anymore if it doesn't serve me anymore if this no longer fits then then i am accepting that it needs to be removed And then the third step, which these are called the three A's, awareness, acceptance, and then action. Action is action. It's the plan, you know, that you can implement to either recover, overcome, restore, whatever those things are that have been lost in the dysfunction. So a lot of times this is when we start working on our self-esteem, our confidence, our, you know, wanting more balance, wanting more peace, wanting more ease, wanting more serenity, wanting more hope, wanting more joy, all of the positive things. And with this, I love to always ask myself the question, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Because sometimes we can't get both. And am I okay with just being happy? Like, what is the payoff for not being happy? Like, really getting honest with yourself. This, this is really deep fact-finding and, and choosing to no longer hide from yourself. And the three A's, awareness, acceptance, and action, and I actually have an, I have an entire chapter on this in the book, Get What You Want, with a, every, every chapter has, like, some homework at the end, like a study guide that you can use. And there's one in there that will really allow you to dive deeper in this. But... To me, these are really the three steps to freedom. My entire life changed once I chose to pause and become aware, accept what is as it is, and accept my part to play in it, and then take action. This is when I really stopped lying to myself, hiding to myself, hiding from myself, lying and hiding from others. This is when I really allowed myself to be seen, not only in the mirror, but to start to be seen by the world around me. Yeah. I mean, I just think of all of those that are craving, you know, the opportunity to get their voice, their message out into the world. They want to find themselves on a platform where they have the ability to impact thousands of people, yet they're hiding from themselves. Right. And they're like, Right. And they're expecting to be seen. That's right. the insanity piece. I have, so, and I'm sure you, you do too, Tori. I'll have women that are just like, I don't understand why I'm, why I'm not growing. I don't understand this. I don't understand this. And they have all these expectations. And I'm like, yeah, but are you truly showing up? Are you truly revealing yourself? Are you truly being honest? And I don't care what you're doing on social media. That, I don't care about that. Are you being honest mm-hmm. with yourself? Are you really allowing yourself to dive deep and, and to get to those hardcore truths about what is keeping you from getting what you want, whatever that is. And I think a lot of times for people, they'll say, well, Julie, I can't get what I want because I don't mm. know what I want. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not being honest with yourself because you always know what you want because you always know what you don't want. 
And so are you really getting honest with what it is that you, like, do you, and it's a choice. Like I no longer, Tori, wanted right. to lie about money. I no longer wanted to be in debt. I no longer wanted to feel like I had to be some version of myself that wasn't real in order to have people like me. I no longer wanted to compare myself. I no longer wanted to feel this desperate need to have to like eat donuts and spit them out in order to love my body. I mean, it was just very, I had to just start really getting honest about these things. Like, I don't want that anymore. That is not joy to me. That is not freedom to me. That is, you know, I no longer want to smoke pot to check out. I mean, whatever those things were for me. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's what, for those listening, that's what I want you to get really honest with yourself. Like, what are those really, what are the things that you think are so dirty, so gross, so awful, and so shameful that you would not want anyone else to know about you? Mm -hmm. Make a list and write those down. And then get really honest with yourself about, do I want to continue to do or believe these things? And then you're, you're going to start to get clear on what it is that you don't want, which is then going to give you the clarity on what it is that you do want, which then gives you the confidence because clarity creates confidence, not the other way around. Right. And a lot of times people, they're, they're waiting to become confident to then get the clarity, but it's actually from the action of getting clarity that creates the confidence. And that can all come from the steps of the three A's of awareness, right. acceptance, and action. Because yeah, as soon as we get clear about what we want, it becomes easy to say no to the things that aren't going to help us get there. And I t to your point about people that say, I don't know what I want. I have two, two thoughts on that. I, a lot of times I'll say, well, if you did know, what would you want? Right. Let's like, let's just, just make it up. If you did know, let's, let's go there. Or I think people are afraid to be honest about what they really want, because if they were to admit it, if they were to say, well, what I really want is to be out of this relationship or what I really want is to start that business or what I really want is to move across the country then it would require them to take ownership and accept responsibility for and take the action thing that for. they desire. Yes. Right. <laughs> because as soon as I put it out there, as soon as I say it, I am there and admit it out loud. There's like something about that that feels like, okay, now it's out there in the universe and now there's something that needs to to happen there's an action that needs to follow as opposed to just staying and keeping that within our own minds and like not sharing that with anyone right which is hiding and expecting to be seen right and that's yeah. i have a whole chapter in the book about i was married once before um to my college sweetheart before my husband now and i'm talking just about that that i literally i knew for years that we were not supposed to be together but he was like my security blanket he was my comfort and so I stayed in that relationship. We were married for a year together for seven years, kind of off and on, but more on than off. And I stayed in that because I thought that that's what everybody else wanted me to do. And that's what was gonna make him feel good. And then I kept saying to myself, it's fine, I'll figure it out. It's fine, it'll be fine, I'll figure it out. Because he is great. He's not a horrible person. He's, you know, it's just like, sure. he's all the things. And, and then I would say to myself like, Julie, what's wrong with you? Why can't you be satisfied? Why can't, like, he's a great guy. Like, what's wrong with you for not loving him the way that you should? What's wrong with you for not wanting to make this work? Why can't you make this work? And it's that what you were just saying, that when I made the decision to wake up and say, this cannot be the rest of my life. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it, but I know deep down in my bones and that small voice, it just keeps getting louder and louder and louder. And if I don't do something now, I'm going to wake up one day and I'm going to be 50 years old with two and a half, 2.5 kids. And I'm not going to know what happened to my life. Mm -hmm. And that is the scariest thing, especially when it comes to relationships yeah. to admit, because now you know it. And once you know, you can't unknow. And yeah. that's the thing, Tori. Like yeah. once you know it, you cannot unknow it. And it's just, it festers in you like a freaking cancer if you don't break free. And, you know, people, we see it happen all the time in the world. You know, people yeah. will stay with people for decades that they know that they shouldn't be with. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that acceptance piece. But the biggest piece is choosing yourself, loving yourself enough to take the action and knowing 
that you will be okay. And it's hard. I've been there for anyone that, you know, has been there or is there now. Like I get it. It's hard. But once you know it, you can't unknow it. That's the thing about awareness is an old coach of mine used to say, ignorance is bliss and awareness is a bitch if you don't do anything about it. Because if you stay in awareness, it's like the light has come on and I can't turn it off. I can't unsee it. I can't unknow it. But if I stay there and I don't act on it, I'm living in at war with myself. And there's so much internal conflict happening all the time. And so it's how can I get off of the straddling the fence and it's like I've got I'm trying to convince myself and talk myself into just be happy just be grateful it's great it's fine I'll figure it out right you'll figure it out as opposed to just honoring what's true for you and what you really desire and letting go of the judgment around what that means and if you're worthy and you actually desire like you deserve that and that's the hump that I think so many people get held back on, which comes back to the, those belief systems that are really deeply ingrained around worthiness. Maybe I don't believe that I deserve what I desire. And if I don't believe that I deserve it, then I'll stay. It, like I'll continue to settle for what I think I'm worthy of, which is maybe, you know, a partnership or a relationship that only meets me, you know, halfway or a job that really sucks the soul out of me, but it pays the bills, you know? And well, and I think that if you are someone that has denied your feelings for so long, you kind of forget that you have them in the first place. And when we are so enmeshed in another person or a job or whatever it is, and we, we become so dependent or codependent on that belief, we tend to forget where we leave off and other people begin. And so it's hard to cut the cord. It's hard to believe in what's possible, but it has to start with you, you know, and that's, you can sit in the awareness, but like you said, it's not going to go away. You have to give yourself the courage and the permission to go into that acceptance piece and to go into that action piece if you truly want to get what you want. Yeah. There's something that you talk about a lot, which is, and you pose this question to readers why am I talking? Um, I do a lot of talking on the show and other parts of my, my business and my life. Um, but I try to make time for a lot of self-reflection and not, um, and sitting in stillness and quiet and, and self-reflection. And I love that this question is a a question of self-reflection. Why am I talking? What is the, what's the message that I want to share and deliver? Um, what's the point of what I'm, is it, am I talking just to talk or to hear myself talk or to make someone laugh or for someone to like me? Can you, um, talk about why that question is important to you and how does it impact our ability to speak and to lead and to share from a place of authenticity and, and confidence? confidence. Yeah. Um, you touched on some really good things there. And I think the other thing that it also gives us is boundaries, Mm -hmm. which I'll share. So why am I talking? If you actually turn it into an acronym, it's wait, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is kind of funny. Why am I talking? Wait, (laughs) W-A-I-T, wait. And it's called wait for a reason. Um, You know, Tori, for a very long time, I... And this kind of just goes back to what we were just saying about not really knowing where you leave off and other people begin. I had really good ideas, I thought, of how everybody else should think, should feel, should act, had, you know, all the advice, come to Julie for all the advice, all the opinions. You know, I have really good ideas about what you should do about your life and what you should do in your relationship and, you know, what you should do in your business and this and this and this, that if they would just listen to me, their life would be a better place and the world would be a better place. But shocker, I know, as it may seem, Julie Solomon does not have all the answers to all the world's problems. And even though I can know a lot of great things and people will happily pay me to guide them and to coach them, it is not my my responsibility to think and feel for them. And I think this is important for, especially for any coaches out there, that 
first thing, I think there's a difference between consulting and coaching. Mm -hmm. And second, I believe that a coach is really not supposed to tell you what to do at all. They're just supposed to hold space and reflect back to you what your inner inner wisdom already knows, because you're always going to know better than I do. And most importantly, your connection to source is going to know better than any of us. And so that's really where you can kind of get to giving it over. So this idea of why am I talking, it really came from a place of of me historically, I used to always jump in and give advice without it being asked. You know, I, someone would just be sharing. And another thing that I love to say, which goes hand in hand with why am I talking is wait for the question mark. Is there a question? (laughs) If not, then why are you giving your advice? Why are you giving your opinion? Why are you giving someone, you know, an answer if there is no question to answer? That's so good. And I think a lot of times people are just wanting to get something off their chest. They're just wanting to share. And I think by always jumping in and and inserting and thinking that we have all the best ideas. When I say we, I just mean people. Thinking, and I know for me, you know, it actually, it actually robs that person of the dignity of having their own experience. Mm. And even if we try to do it to like save somebody, I mean, heaven forbid, like what if my husband would have just like saved me from that credit card situation? Mm. You know, like what if he would have just come in and fixed it? Right. Then it would have robbed me of the dignity of having that experience, of having the rock bottom, of learning what I needed to learn to then have the life that I have today. Right. And so I truly believe that sometimes we need to get the heck out of the way, get the heck out of the line of fire so someone can truly have their own experience and really giving them the dignity of that. And there, of course, is a fine line between how do I support and how do I hold space and how am I, how do I keep inserting myself into something and so that's where the idea of like wait why am i talking comes into play is it because i want to and usually if you offer advice more than once you're trying to control so for me the wait why am i talking it stems a lot from my control issues Mm -hmm. i am because i do still and i have to catch myself just in my own recovery and here's the thing tori with with people who are coaches like there is a lot that we do know. Sure. Like we do have a lot of wisdom. We do have a lot of guidance. And we still don't know what's best. And so it it is this teetering. It is this dance. It's this flow and this balance that we have to find between really being able to reflect back to somebody what it is that they need to uncover, what it is that they need to unlock and, you know, potentially guiding them and really just kind of sharing our own experience mm. and our own strength and and hopefully it will give them the hope to do the same but it's not about well let me tell them what to do because then it makes me feel in control which makes me feel safe which makes me feel better which makes me feel more powerful or let me you know jump in and you know talk because i kind of want what i want when i want it and how i want it and so i'm gonna get it Mm -hmm. by kind of like manipulating and driving this conversation and look we all do it and i know manipulation that word can be very triggering triggering for people but when we're being honest with ourselves especially if you are like a really high performer and high achiever, you can also be highly influ- influential or highly manipulative. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're kind of cousins, right? Mm-hmm. Like, are we using it for good or are we using it to kind of get something that we want in a negative way? And so it's just about the the wait. Why am I talking? It allows you to wait and bring in what I call the power of the pause. And the power of the pause can be huge. It can allow things to unfold naturally. It can allow people to come up with their own solutions to things. It can allow you to maybe think and feel differently if you give yourself some time to do it. It of course allows you to get honest about why am I wanting to say something right now? You know, am I trying to prove a point? As I mentioned, am I trying to control? Am I trying to get somebody to do what it is that I want them to do? Am I trying to feel important? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what is it? And, um, and, and then the, so that's kind of one side to the coin. The other side to the coin of it is, and going back to what you were saying with articulation and really using my voice, it also can come from that. Why do I want to say what I want to say right now? Like, how is this helping me 
A, become, become in alignment with what my true mission and my true vision is in my life. You know, how is me expressing this in this way going to help me serve my greater purpose, going to help me, you know, serve my clients? You know, how is sharing this really going to allow me to effectively communicate with someone in a way that, you know, really empowers the connection and the energy that we have. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the other side to it as well. But for me, you know, sometimes the best response that I have learned to have, and this is someone, if you're like me, who I have spent my entire life jumping in and yeah. like being part of a con, like it is just default. Right. Like I don't even think, I had to really train myself to hold back. So now it's like, even if my husband will come in and you know, it's like he'll come in about something. And if if you're a pro, if you're a fixer like I am and a problem solver, it's like, oh, I've got, I've got solutions to your problems all day. Like, what do you need? But sometimes he'll come in or a client or whatever, and I'll just say, hmm, yeah, hmm, oh, hmm. And it, like, I can't even be quiet because I'm so defaulted to like speaking. Sure. <laughs> so like, I'll have to just go, hmm. Right. And that just, that allows me to, to have that pause. The other thing that helps is if someone comes at you with a question or with a need or with a challenge, and it's your default to kind of reactively respond. And it, like, as simple as it sounds, this, this is like another thing that changed my life. I'll say, hmm, let me get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Let me get back to you on that. Right. And it's, it's crazy what will happen just by saying that it gives you more time to think and feel through something. A lot, 99% of the time, whatever the thing is, it like fixes its, its, itself. <laughs> yeah. Just like not always being the first to jump in mm -hmm. with this responses, with the ideas. It's, it can be life-changing. So that's a very long way to answer that really layered and complex question. <laughs> it, well, there are so many ways you can unpack that question. And I think you brought so like so much good like light to all of the ways that it can be used. But what really stuck out to me uh, was this unconscious codependency that we have on whether it's a coaching client relationship, whether it's a partnership, whether it's friendships, when we play that role of somebody who always has the answers or always has, you know, a response or is just going to naturally like lead the conversation, then we don't allow, we're, we're disempowering our client or our friend or our partner from, yeah, finding like stepping into their own power and their own ability to find their answers because we have been in this savior kind of position of, Oh, I'll figure it out. I'll fit like, I'll fix it for you. I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you where to go. And it's a disservice. And we feed off of it. Right. It's an oxytocin hit for, for, for us, you know, to be like, oh, I'm powerful. I'm liked. Right. I'm loved. I'm validated. I People come to me for all the answers. I'm I important. matter. And it, and it yeah. reestablishes this egoic like identity that I'm important and, but we're, we, we like, I feel like it's a, yeah, it's such a disservice to the person that we are in, in relation with, like relationship with. And that's something I'm going to take away, like from this conversation is truly thinking about like, how do I think, is it the best, like, and am I being the best of service when I just come in and fix it and have all the answers and say the thing, or do I create the space where the person, they have to ask, they have to use their voice and step into their power and say, Hey, what do you think about this? Or, Hey, can you like help me? And they have to actually ask for their need to be met instead of us assuming or jumping to conclusions. And that's where that, that healthy communication gets to, to happen. Otherwise, we're just staying in these roles, this roles of I'm the leader and I know best and you don't and you need me and you feed off of me like almost. An, and I need you to right, need me. Exactly. And that's the essence of codependency. And I see it happen in client coach relationships a lot, there's almost like this, um, it can be like a parent child dynamic that starts to get reflected of like, mom, what do you think? Or, Hey, I'm going to the coach, like for your approval for you to sign off and say, yes, I'm doing the right thing. And as a coach, I'm only best serving you when I 
create the space for you to step into your power that says you validate yourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's why, you know, I always tell my clients, I'm like, I, I am not responsible for your success, for your anything. You know, I just express my own and I hold space for you to also do that. And I empower you to think and feel for yourself. And yes, I will guide you and consult you if that's what you want as well in certain areas. But really, really pushing back to give people, because how is someone supposed to get confidence and truly believe in themselves as confident people if now they're learning from their coach that they have to go to their coach for everything? Right. Well, that's like the same thing as I have to go to my husband to get approval to, to buy exactly. something, right? It's exactly. who's the door, the, the gatekeeper for what I can and can't do. And I think what's beautiful about your book and what you're teaching people through Get What You Want, it's how do I become that person in my life where I'm no longer outsourcing my power to everybody else or my happiness or my value, but I become the one that validates my experience and that has the keys to create the future that I want for myself. And that's like, that is a invaluable gift that you're giving people through this book. Um, and it's this roadmap for people for how do I go from this space of, Hey, I'm, I'm settling or there's gotta be more than this, or, you know, this isn't everything I thought it would be to how do I get what I really want? How do I get honest about that? And then you give people kind of the steps to, to creating that. Yeah. And there's so much, you know, there's, you know, I taught, there's a whole chapter on boundaries, hmm. how to create them, the non-negotiables, you know, the, the, why am I talking? And then there's, you know, wait for the question mark that I mentioned earlier. There's some other kind of tools that you can use, um, in that way to really help with any kind of dependent or codependent type behaviors. Um, a lot about unlocking your origin story. And then, you know, we go into your purpose and your why and your vision. It really is a step-by-step -step roadmap to help somebody go from feeling so unseen to feeling unstoppable, really. Mm -hmm. Well, the book is out today, you guys. You can go get it. it you don't have to pre-order. You can get your own you signed get copy. You can get it. Yes. And, um, you can, we're going to um, put all the links. But go ahead and tell us where you. people can go go grab it if they want. Yes. Get so copy. you can go, you can get it wherever you love to buy books or there's also an audible. So if you, if you're like my husband, who's dyslexic and you like to listen to books, you can get mm -hmm. that. I recommend for this one because there's so much, um, how to and step by step and just good kind of journaling work. If you listen to the audible, but then also get the book that way you can highlight things. You can write things out. That's just how I love to learn. I like to Same. listen and read. Yeah. Um, you, if you go to juliesolomon.net slash get what you want, you can, there's everything is there. You also get some bonuses by ordering from our page. You get a ticket to a free live virtual get what you want workshop that I'm doing later this summer. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and you have an option to get a signed copy, um, there as well. And then I would just love to know everybody that, that listens to this incredible show. If you have feedback for Tori and I, I tend to hang out the most on Instagram at Jules, J U L S Solomon. S-O-L-O-M-O-N. I would love to know um, what your biggest takeaway was from our conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to put all of that in the show notes, make it super easy for you to get connected with Julie and make sure you get your hands on a copy of Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. Julie, thank you for being here. Congratulations on this big release and um, thank you for your work and your message in the world. Thank you, Tori. It's wonderful to be here with you. You guys, we have a special announcement and giveaway for this episode specifically. Julie has been so gracious and is gifting our audience three signed copies of her new book, um, Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. And this is a book you want to get your hands on, I promise. All you have to do to enter to win one of her signed copies is to leave a rating and a review of this podcast, the Coachable Podcast. And in the title of your review, all you have to do is put Get What You Want as the title and then leave your review below that and you'll be entered to win one of her um special signed copies of the book, Get What You Want. We will hand select uh, three people to give those to, and then we will let you know if you won. We will send you an email 
and uh, get all of your information. Make sure in your review to leave us your email so that we know how to get in touch with you if you do win. So all you have to do, go to the Coachable Podcast, leave a rating and review in the title, put get what you want and leave your review under it, and then put your email address so that we can get in touch with you if you win. So good luck. We hope that you love this episode and can't wait to give three lucky winners your own signed copy of Get What You Want. Till next time, see you on the Coachable Podcast. <laughs>